Hi everybody, this is an ongoing series examining the dungeon design in Zelda games. We've already taken a look at all of Ocarina of Time's dungeons, so go check that out if you'd like. Otherwise, let's hop into Majora's Mask. This is it, my personal favorite dungeon in the game. It has a fan favorite reputation for a reason. But before we get to the dungeon itself, there's a lot to do, even more so than any of the dungeons up until this point. First, if you haven't already, make sure to get the Garo Mask from the Gorman Brothers at Milk Road. Otherwise, this creepy dude won't even let us head into Ikana Canyon proper. Next, we'll want to make sure to head over to Ikana Graveyard, where we'll find this big bony boy. Play the Sonoda of Awakening, and he'll get up and start moving. This is Captain Kita. As you approach him, there's these flame barriers and style children that will get in your way. You can stun him with your bow to give yourself more time, but once you catch up and attack him, it'll only take a few hits before he yields. And he'll shed some light on the situation here. There was a war going on in Ikana some time ago. Everyone is dead now, but their spirits are restless, and so the conflict rages on. He'll ask that you tell his men the war is over and put this conflict to rest. This gives us the captain's hat. Now, during the night, we can use the mask to interact with these Stal children. On the night of the first day, we can command these guys to open up this grave. There's goodies to get on each night by doing this actually, in particular a heart piece on the second night and an empty bottle on the third. However, as far as what's mandatory goes, let's take a look at the grave on the first night. We'll drop into this underground cavern where we'll have to go up against an iron knuckle. Now we fought these guys in Ocarina of Time and here they still remain some of the toughest enemies around. If you have the gilded sword however, you should still be able to make short work of it. We'll then meet the spirit of one of the composer brothers. This is Flat. He'll ask that you confront his brother who he had something of a falling out with, and play him the song that he wrote. Then we learn the Song of Storms. Okay, now let's head to the actual Icana Canyon proper. If we show this creepy guy that we have the Garrow's Mask, he'll let us up by providing this tree as a hookshot target. Then we can use ice arrows to freeze these octo rocks and hookshot up the trees along the sides of the canyon and up to the top. This is the Haunted Kingdom of Icana. Okay, let's pause to just talk about this place for a second. This is one of the most absolutely chilling and creepy locations in the entire series, and I love it. Just adding to that haunted vibe is the Garrow. Now and then, Tattle will mention that she can sense a thirst for blood in the air, which is worrying enough on its own, but if you wear the Garrow's mask, one of these guys will appear. The Garrow are apparently the spirits of spies that were from an enemy nation during that war. When they appear, they think initially that you're their leader, but clue in pretty quick before attacking you. They aren't hard to defeat, you just have to block their attack and hit them once, but even still, their very presence is eerie. They can give you some pretty useful hints however. Also as usual the cursed area theme comes back in full swing with its scariest rendition yet. The other versions certainly fit their own brands of danger but this one has tones of horror thrown in. The song begins with this scary build up piano chords are deep and resonating. The choir voices sound like ghosts howling in the wind, in particular this bit right here. Chilling. Just chilling. Now you'll notice this lone house being surrounded by Gibdos, which apparently is home to a lone parent and child who live there. Yikes. We'll want to head up the path of the river where the water source should be. We'll be confronted in this cave by Sharp, the other composer brother, who plays us a nice song that will kill us. Thanks. Just a bit of trivia, but if you play him the Song of Healing, he'll ease up for just a moment, saying that he feels at peace, before continuing to play, showing just how far gone this place is. Instead, we play him the Song of Storms, per his brother's request, and he'll get a migraine. And also the flow of water will be restored. Sharp thanks us, saying that his brother's song broke the curse on his soul, and reiterates how the dead here need to be put to rest. Now with the water flowing, this water wheel will be powered, which plays the music on this music box. And yes, it is the most annoying song in the game. This song drives away the Gibdos. We can use the stone mask to sneak by this little girl, Pamela, and into the house where we'll meet her dad? 
This half man, half Gibdo is such a haunting sight. Don't attack him though. We can play him the Song of Healing to restore him to his normal state, which creates the Gibdo Mask. This is such an emotional moment in the game. Presumably, Pamela has been living here with her dad as a zombie, locked in the closet for some time. What a nightmare. Okay, with the Gibdo Mask, Redeads and Gibdos will not attack us. The next bit is one of the most tedious fetch quests in the series, so here goes. First thing you'll want to start with, I suggest heading down to the Southern Swamp. You'll want to buy 5 magic beans from the Deku Salesman here. You will also need a blue potion, which you can either get for 200 rupees from the Deku Salesman at the Canyon, or for free from the potion shop by bringing the Hag a mushroom. Next, make sure to get yourself another powder keg. You can buy them at the bomb shop as Goron Link for 50 rupees. With at the very least those three things, we can head into the caves beneath the well. Because we didn't have enough nightmares at the bottom of the well in Ocarina of Time, we have this Gibdo infested labyrinth to deal with now. Thankfully, we're not in too much danger with the Gibdo mask. In this cave system are tons of locked doors. The Gibdos will each unlock their door for you in exchange for some material item. With the exception of those beans and that potion, we can get nearly everything else we need in here. But those first two Gibdos require the potion and the beans, so save yourself some pain and just come prepared. I also suggest having at least four, but preferably five or all six bottles by now, as having the extra carrying capacity will reduce backtracking. Reduce, that is. There is still going to be a lot of back and forth. However, at the end of all of this, we'll find this room. Light the torches to reveal the treasure chest, which gives us the mirror shield. It works just like it did in Ocarina of Time, but that functionality gets put to even better use in this game. More on that soon. It's put to good use right away, of course. We can activate this sun switch to reveal a ladder and shine the light on this sun block to remove it from the path. Now we can follow this ladder up and we'll find ourselves in Icana Castle. Yep, so this is still not Stone Tower, but another mini dungeon that needs doing before we get to the main one. We can use the mirror shield to create a shortcut in and out of the castle through to the canyon, but otherwise, let's head on inside. Okay, first thing to mention, check out the sweet dance moves. Icana Castle is pretty straightforward, but as far as mini dungeons go, it's among my favorites. From this foyer are three paths. The central path is blocked by this giant sunblock that we'll come back to later. Same goes for the path to the south, so the northern door is our only option. There's this falling checkerboard room, which is pretty straightforward. This push switch opens the door, and don't get squashed. We can fly through this room, literally, and we'll be upstairs and outside on the balcony. We'll want to fly over to this switch, which will open the sunroof on the inside of the southern chamber. Now heading back inside, we can remove that sunblock from the southern room. By the way, with all of these creepy undead enemies, we can use the mirror shield to basically one-shot all of them, and it's overpowered fun that I really wish Ocarina of Time had tapped into. The next room takes us into a mini boss fight against a whiz robe. Now we fought a blue one in Snowhead twice, and this red one doesn't mix things up too much. So just snipe him like before and you'll be just fine. Now we can take the stairs onto the other side of the balcony and use the powder keg I said we needed to blow a hole in the roof here. This allows light to shine into the foyer room so we can unlock that final central path and face off against the boss of the mini dungeon. This is Igos du Icana, the king of Icana kingdom, and here's his lackeys. They'll draw the curtains up and challenge you to do combat. Hilariously, if you wear the captain's hat, Igos will get confused confused for a moment thinking that you are Kita, but then realize you're wearing a mask because you're too small. I love that detail. Okay, so we have to take on the two lackeys first. I suggest using fire arrows to burn the curtains so you can use the overpowered goodness of the mirror shield to dish out some damage. Otherwise, if you've played Ocarina of Time and fought any style foes in that game, then this battle should come as no challenge to you. Just make sure when they're down to use the mirror shield to burn their bodies away. Once they're done and out, the king himself will confront you. Same tactic for him, however. He has more attack variety as he has some sort of icy breath in addition to his sword, but if you keep at him, you'll be able to get him down the same way. Once he's down, the lackeys will start arguing, and he'll shush them saying that this sort of bickering is what caused their kingdom to fall into ruin, and their spirits to linger. Igos gets pretty real with us here, asking that Link break the curse on his kingdom, the source of which is in Stone Tower. He teaches us the Elegy of Emptiness, which allows us to shed an empty shell of ourselves in place in the form of these weird statues. In combination with our 
tasks, we can create up to four empty shells, which will be needed in Stone Tower for some interesting puzzles. As cool a mechanic as this is, this shell in particular just gives me the creeps. That face, ugh. Though the ones for the transformations are pretty cool. So the next thing we need to do is ascend the stone tower to get up to the actual temple entrance. In conjunction with the hookshot and using the Elegy of Emptiness to push down these switches and move these blocks around, we can make our way up the tower. I do sort of wish this part was a bit less tedious, as we're gonna be playing that song a lot of times. Thankfully, a warp statue is at the very top, so you really only have to do this once. But still, it's a long but worthwhile way up to the dungeon entrance. is, in my honest opinion, the cream of the crop when talking Zelda Dungeons. It's unique in what you could consider its gimmick, but more importantly, it does what every final dungeon should do. It takes every mechanic, detail, and gameplay element that the game has thrown at us up until now, and makes good use of them all. Some compare this to the Spirit Temple from Ocarina of Time, having two dungeon items, and in the same way you have to explore the dungeon in two halves, but while those were just two sides of the same building, Stone Tower puts a brilliant twist on all of this. Just like the dungeons that preceded it, Stone Tower also requires us to make a transformation to the dungeon itself. But this isn't just raising a platform or changing the water current, this is the most brilliant dungeon alteration I have ever seen in a Zelda game, and an idea we haven't really revisited since then, but more on that soon. I can't sing my praises to Stone Tower enough, but then again, knowing my penchant for challenge, it makes sense. This is the game's most difficult dungeon, as it should be, and the dungeon that will take the longest to complete. Architecture-wise, this dungeon definitely returns to a far more temple-like feel, with huge statues and iconography. Where it differs from previous dungeons is that I find it hard to point out a single room as being the main central room. You could make a case for the foyer, this large vertical room, and this bridge room all to be central rooms, since you'll probably crisscross through all of them, but none of them quite feel right to call that. I actually see this as a good shakeup from previous dungeons though, and a testament to how much more complex the design is here. Stone Tower still trips me up sometimes, and that's great. There's purpose and thought put into every room, so it's simply not a dungeon you can just rush through. You have to stop and think about your actions and make good use of your map. Honestly, it's wonderful. Let's quickly talk about the music here. It's one of my favorite dungeon themes in the series, right up there with the Forest Temple. It takes the haunted sounding chanting choirs that we heard in Icana Canyon and Icana Castle and builds on it with what is honestly just a catchy melody. Most interestingly, the instrumentation feels like a combination of all the instruments that Link can play in his different forms, with the ocarina taking the spotlight. A realization I came to while having to play the Elegy of Emptiness over and over again, just while making it to the dungeon. Interestingly, the Elegy itself is actually the main part of the song. So yeah, we've got our drums. This instrument, which sounds similar to the pipes. Our strings. And of course, the ocarina. musical culmination really fits this level design to a T. While every dungeon up until now has focused on a single one of Link's transformations, Stone Tower makes use of all of them, with Link's highly informed being the most vital. As usual, let's not forget about the 15 stray fairies to collect, which are naturally the most well hidden in the game. Okay, when we first enter the foyer, there's a few noteworthy things. Most obvious is the eye switch staring at us on this huge statue. Shooting it will reveal this chest on the platform in the center of the room for our first stray fairy. There's three doors from the central room here. The center door is locked shut, and if we go through the eastern door, this path is blocked by this huge sunblock. Ah, 
familiar. So the western door is our only way to progress. This takes us into this winding corridor. The end of this hall is barred shut, so there's a handful of switches to press down in order to open it. You can use the Elegy of Emptiness for these, but to save yourself some repetition playing that song, there's also these crates you can use for some of the switches as well. This takes us out into this courtyard room, which has two doors, but we don't have the key we need for this one, so instead we can head down the stairs and into the basement room. However, you'll quickly see that there's not actually much we can do here, so make sure to bomb this section of the floor in the courtyard room to allow light to shine down into the basement room. Now you can use the mirror shield to remove the sunblock from in here, use Goron Link to cross the lava, and get yourself the map from that chest. Defeat the Armos while you're here as well to reveal another chest which has the key that we needed. There's also a pretty easy to miss stray fairy in this room, which you can reach with the hookshot, so make sure to grab that now to save yourself some painful backtracking later. Now we can head back to the courtyard and spend that key on the locked door. This takes us into this bridge room. There's some sunblocks here that you can't do much with now, and this bridge with rails on it, so there isn't much to do just yet. There's a treasure chest on this ledge which you can jump up to if you time it just right, but it's actually easier if you just let this Dexy hand grab you since he'll toss you right up there. That chest contains a key. Now as a Zora, you can swim down this hallway and into this large flooded room. There's a lot of stuff in this room, much of which we can't do yet. Make sure to press the switch on the bottom of the room which will make a treasure chest appear, but on the ceiling. We'll come back for that, don't worry. Otherwise you can rise back up to the surface of the water. There's a beam of light shining down onto the floor which we can reflect this mirror. Tattle will hint that there's something different about this mirror, and if you test it out you'll see that there's a sort of delay to the reflection somehow. So what you can do is reflect light onto it, and it'll hold the light briefly so you can go and use the mirror shield to reflect the light off of it again. This sounds more complicated than it is in practice, I swear. Doing this successfully will remove this sunblock, which creates a shortcut back to the foyer. There's also a chest here with the compass inside. While you're here, there's a frozen eye switch, which you can activate with a fire arrow to reveal another ceiling chest. Okay, you can spend that key on the locked door at the north end of this room. This next room has some pillars, which you can break apart as Goron Link to reveal this beam of light. You'll notice several sunblocks and sun switches in this room. You can use the mirror shield to activate the sun switches here. Most of them will spawn enemies, but this one will instead reveal a treasure chest with a stray fairy. Otherwise, this expands on the mirror puzzle we just saw in the last room. You'll need to reflect this light from the beam to the first mirror, off your shield to the second mirror, then off your shield again, and to this sunblock. This can be tricky to do since you have to be quick, but the premise here makes for a great puzzle. There's a second sunblock off to the side, which you can do the same with for another stray fairy. The next room is a tricky one. One. First, you can cross the lava as Goron Link to activate this switch. Then at the start of the room, we can use this Deku flower to fly across. There's these gusts of air to keep us afloat, though Deku Link doesn't have the greatest turn radius, so this room is easier said than done. That chest has a stray fairy, but otherwise, we can head into the next room. This next room is an arena where the mid-boss appears. Remember those Garo ninja ghosts we've been fighting? Well, this is the Garo Master. This fight is a lot like those previous battles, but a lot more difficult. He's pretty nimble hopping around constantly, and he can catch you off guard with his flame swords if you're not careful. As counterintuitive as this is going to sound, because of how quick he is, I actually recommend not targeting him. Instead, wait for him to jump into the air and use the speed of the bunny hood to evade him and strike when he lands. That's just my tactic though. With enough persistence, he should go down quickly enough. He'll tell you that there's an emblem outside the temple that we can activate with golden light, which will rearrange things, and then he explodes himself. Talk about flair for the dramatic. The door will unlock and a chest will appear with the dungeon item, light arrows. This completes our set of dungeon items, with the bow and our different arrow types. This next hallway has a pretty strange layout, but we can pass on through for now. We'll end up back in the bridge room from before, but now on the center of that railed bridge. There's an Igor here blocking our path however, so we'll need to take him on. He's not as tough as he looks though. Just shoot his eye with light arrows a bunch and he'll go down. This reveals a another treasure chest with a fairy, and lets us pass through the door, which takes us back to the foyer. Real quick, before we take the Garo Master's advice to activate that emblem outside, we can go back into the bridge room on the outer section and use light arrows on these blocks. There's a switch on the east side, which reveals a chest on the west side for, yeah, another stray fairy. Now we can head to just outside of the dungeon, and sure enough, using the switches to move this block reveals that red emblem. Use light arrows to activate it, and everything will rearrange as the entire dungeon is flipped upside down. <laughs> So 
so if you couldn't tell, the entire dungeon is now inverted, meaning all of those doors and treasure chests we could see on the ceiling before are now accessible to us. Can I just gush at how brilliant a twist this is on the dungeon alteration idea? This effectively doubles the dungeon, and this was already a pretty large-scale dungeon to begin with. With this mechanic, however, we're in for some really fantastic puzzles. Okay, so we're back in the foyer. At this point, only the eastern door is accessible. We can head in and use light arrows to remove the sunblock. We'll find ourselves in the flooded room from before, except I guess all the water fell out of the skylights here. There's some of those ceiling treasure chests that we can now nab for some more stray fairies. There's some Deku flowers to help navigate in here, but what we'll need to do is head down that corridor towards the Dexy hand and push that switch to reveal a treasure chest, which contains a key. Now we can use these wind gusts to get to the top of the room and spend our key on the locked door. This next hallway is our first taste of some inversion puzzles. There's an emblem we can shoot in here with light arrows. We need to flip the room, use Goron form to cross the lava, and then flip the room again to reach the door. The next room here is where the inversion puzzle really takes shape. There's this push block, which we need to push into this spot in the opposite corner of the room. However, the floor has all of these ledges and dips, so it's not as straightforward as it seems at a glance. We'll need to use light arrows and rotate the room, push the block, rotate the room, push the block some more, you get the idea. It's a bit repetitive, but this puzzle is so creative. With the block in place, the door opens and takes us to our second mid-boss fight. And it's another whiz rope. We've already fought these guys a bunch, so it should be no challenge at this point. But if you want to mix things up a bit, did you know that you can reflect his attacks with the mirror shield? It's kind of tricky to get it to hit him, but it is possible. But sniping him with your bow, just like before, is just the easier option. Once he's dead, a treasure chest will appear with a straight fairy, but more importantly, it acts as a hookshot target to reach the staircase on that ledge. This takes us out into the courtyard room, but since it's inverted now, don't fall. There's some pose here that you can actually one-shot with light arrows, and you'll want to fly across and into that corridor where we previously activated the push blocks. There'll be a handful of enemies called Death Armos in here. They'll try to stomp on you, but all you have to do is shoot a light arrow at their little symbol thingy to flip them upside down, and then they'll smash their own heads into the ground, killing themselves. There's a push switch to extinguish this flame so you can nab that key. Now if you go out the other courtyard door it'll take you into the now inverted bridge room. Now here's where I tend to get a bit tripped up myself because I get overzealous and I want to head towards the boss door right away. There's a door that'll take us back into the foyer but first we can use these deco flowers to cross this room, head through the door, and cross this gated corridor and come face to face with a third mid boss. This is Gomez. Man he just oozes with that creepy factor. He's surrounded by bats, which will protect him from damage, so you can't just rush him with your sword. Instead, you can shoot at him with light arrows to disperse the bats and open him up for attack. Just watch out, because he's got a mean swing with that scythe, though with our improved defense, he'll only dish out a single heart of damage. After a few good hits, he'll go down in the most dramatic fashion, earning us the boss key. Okay, backtrack a bit to the bridge room, and we can cross again with these deco flowers. If we take that side door into the foyer and press this switch, it'll reveal another ceiling treasure chest. Just watch out for the death armos here. You can hookshot onto the chest, and if you haven't yet already, make sure to activate that sun switch using a light arrow. At this point, it's a straight shot down the hallway to the boss room, but if you're looking for a full completion, then I suggest ducking out quickly here to revert the dungeon to its non-inverted state to nab a few of those stray fairies if you haven't already. Since some of those chests will only appear when the dungeon is inverted, but then are only accessible when the dungeon is normal, it's kind of a pain. Otherwise, if we head through that upper door in the foyer and into the bridge room, we'll have a rematch with Igor and earn the second dungeon item, the Giant's Mask. This is super cool, but sadly underutilized. Through the next door, there's some hookshotting up this corridor, and through the boss door. We'll be in the room where we fought the Garrow Master, but now the skylight is some sort of portal. So, in we jump. The portal appears to take us to some sort of deserted wasteland, covered in a sandstorm. The boss wastes no time making an entrance though. Or should I say bosses? Yeah, there's two. This is Twin Mold, a pair of giant sand serpent bug things. This is another case of the concept art being so good, but them looking kind of meh in game. But hey, even still, the sheer scale of these guys is so cool. Each of them have a weak point on their tail and head that you can shoot at, which is a difficult but totally viable way to take them down. However, it's much easier and way more fun if we use our newly acquired giant's mask. 
this will transform Link into, well, a giant. While in giant form, our magic power will be constantly consumed. However, you can break these pillars and ruins for magic drops. You can totally just cheese this fight by hacking and slashing away at them. They move quickly though, constantly burrowing in and out of the sand, so a bit of patience is required. But you'll get through them soon enough. It's chaotic, but also just super fun to do. There's something about becoming gigantic and overpowered that just feels so great in this fight, and having the option to choose whether or not to use that mask or simply snipe them is great. But okay, let's address the 3DS remake for a moment. First off, the portal looks way cooler, and Twin Mold themselves really benefited from the graphical update. The changes to their designs are super minimal, but those faces especially look absolutely terrifying in a great way. It does their original concept art far more justice. That said, the added giant eyeballs on the underbelly of one of them look so hokey and out of place. Why the giant eyeballs? Why always with the giant eyeballs? The boss fight changes here are most dramatic out of the four as well, and I think I like the ideas here conceptually, but not in practice. First off, the game now withholds the giant mask until after you defeat the first twin mold, making blue here our first target. We're now forced to snipe his giant eyeballs with the bow to make him vomit this larger eyeball, which we can then attack head on. Once he's down, then we get the giant's mask and we can grow to take on the red one. Except, oh giant's mask, what did they do to you? Okay, first of all, we can't use our sword anymore as a giant. I guess they decided Link should just go full King Kong mode instead. Something about Link punching like this just feels so off to me. Now, there's also a bunch of baby twin molds that will also come after you, but what you'll want to do is try to awkwardly punch the red one here. Removing your sword completely nerfs your range, however. This just feels so awkward. Once you've punched him a bunch, you'll have a chance to grab his tail and slam him around a bit. I'm gonna confess that this might look pretty cool watching it, but doing it? That's another story. <sighs> Here's what bothers me. With the original Giant's Mask, since you retain your sword and your normal mobility, it's pretty intuitive. This is just an extension of Link's abilities. This version strips away those abilities instead of adding to them, and replaces them with something that's clunky and awkward to do. Ah, uh, and it takes forever. Twin Mold just refuses to die here. I'm fine with spectacle, and while I prefer being able to choose how I want to be able to defeat Twin Mold, making use of both gameplay options isn't a bad choice in theory for the remake. But when we get the Giant's Mask, it should aid in the fight, not hamper it. If they gave it to you halfway through the fight and then let us go ham on him for the second half in an overpowered fury, that would be so awesome. And I think that's what they were going for. But because they removed the original mechanics of the mask and replaced it with this sluggish, brutish, awkward moveset, using the giant's mask simply doesn't feel rewarding to me. So yeah, Majora's Mask 3D's twin mold fight gets a big thumbs down from me. Once the both defeated, we'll collect Twin Mold's remains. Odd detail, but in the original version, it's the blue one, and in the 3DS, it's the red one. Which is the perfect analogy for my own feelings about this fight. The original one is cool, and the remake makes me angry. At least they look good. Don't forget that heart container, and we'll see the final giant now, who says, call us, and we're out. The curse is lifted from Icana. The dead can rest, and all four giants are freed. Don't forget to return the stray fairies as usual, which will give us the absolutely overpowered Great Fairy Sword, which is pretty much like the big Goron sword from Ocarina of Time, except it's purple. So that's the dungeon. Stone Tower, in my eyes, earns its reputation as one of the greatest dungeons in all of Zelda. It perfectly embodies what a final dungeon should be. It's challenging, creative, and combines all of the elements that we've learned until now. What I think I love about this is that while Ganon's castle in Ocarina of Time kind of does the same, it's in a much more segmented and in-your-face way, with literally labeled rooms that reference their dungeons. Meanwhile, Stone Tower implements those design ideas 
while keeping its own identity, and assimilates these ideas without segmenting them. Oh, and it still manages to throw new awesome mechanics at us while doing so. It feels far less like we're simply reviewing what we've learned until now, and instead like a triumphant culmination of our own growth as a player. It's sublime. Of course, I do have nitpicks. They were tapping into something so great with these room flipping puzzles, and I would honestly like to have seen even more of them. I know the dungeon can only be so long, but come on, we were onto something amazing here, and it's really limited to just a few select rooms. Another nitpick, and this is just more so an issue with the N64 itself, but because the dungeon does so well at using all of your abilities, the amount of items switching and pausing is pretty extreme. There's going to be a lot of pausing to equip arrows, equip the hookshot, the ocarina, the different masks, you get the idea. Something the game could have benefited from would be just more inventory slots. The controller has unused buttons in the form of the D-pad and the L button. While they may be somewhat awkward to use, it would still be less tedious than pausing. All you have to do is look no further than Wind Waker HD to see how this could work, as that game maps some of the more important items to the D-pad. The 3DS version does do better with this, but the N64 version is really pushed to its limits in regards to item management. But alas, speaking of having to do repetitive things, the Elegy of Emptiness, while being a great song that ties thematically in with the dungeon music itself, also wears pretty thin in my opinion. As far as its usage goes, it's basically the Cane of Samaria from A Link to the Past, but instead of creating these blocks, it's these statues. I guess it does the job, but you'll get tired of hearing it before you even get to the dungeon. Really minor detail, but this also bugs me. You can reach that one staircase in the inverted courtyard room, but she can't can't go in it. They could have made it inaccessible or barred off or something, I just don't like invisible walls. Final gripe, but Gomez is too easy. He's such a cool mid-boss, and I just would have loved it if he posed a greater threat. Overall though, those complaints are pretty small. Stone Tower is a timeless classic with some of the best design in the series, and is my personal favorite dungeon in all of 3D Zelda. It's just that good. So this game doesn't have a final dungeon like Ganon's Tower for example, so I just want to talk about the game's ending and wrap things up with Majora's Mask. If you're a completionist like me, then you'll want to complete every side quest and all of that good stuff. At the top of the clock tower on the final night, you can play Oath to Order to call the giants, get the most chilling dialogue in the entire franchise, and end up on the moon where you can challenge Majora. If you got all the masks, you can get the extremely overpowered Fierce Deities mask, which makes the fight way too easy, but is such a cool reward for that extra effort. Otherwise, this ends up being a really cool final boss fight. Either way, that Chateau Romani goes a long way, giving you unlimited magic power. Obviously, Zelda is my favorite franchise, but beyond that, Majora's Mask is one of my favorite games of all time. It somehow manages to build off of what many argue to be the best Zelda game ever, improve upon that, and also act as a wild departure. It has some of the best writing, best music, and most in-depth characters and story. Between the looping three-day cycle and the moon looming overhead at all times, there's this constant tension, stress, and relief as you make your way through Termina. There is so much tragedy, loss, joy, freedom, fun, helplessness, determination, and hope. This is the game that sets out to not just be another Zelda game, years before Nintendo had decided to break their own conventions. This is the installment that showed us a darker, more mature side of the series. The one that didn't talk down to its audience. It was hard, but you earned that challenge. And overcoming it is bittersweet, heartbreaking, and triumphant. It's a masterpiece, one of the single greatest pieces of media, of art, that I've ever gotten to experience. This is the problem with the 3DS version as well. Tattle's too helpful, many puzzles are simplified, and abilities that were great in the original are either removed or watered down in the remake. The original respected that you had it in you to do this. Navi was there to handhold you in Ocarina of Time, but she left, and while Tattle certainly grows on us, she is a reluctant partner initially. But the remake decides that you need to be handheld again. It doesn't respect the skill or intelligence of the player, and betrays what makes the original unique by implementing tropes that are already tired and ubiquitous of the series. I've heard people say that 
that their remake better fulfills the original vision of the game and achieves what the N64 just wasn't technically capable of. But I don't think that's true. If we're talking graphics, sure. But do you really think Aonuma had a vision in the year 2000 of making swimming worse? No. What I believe is that Nintendo tasked Grezzo with making this game, but were worried about its sales. They decided they should make it more accessible. But whereas Breath of the Wild is more accessible because of how free it lets you be, Majora's Mask 3D traps you on a linear path. Instead of letting you try to be creative, it shoves the correct methods down your throat all the time. I was so excited when they announced the remake, but when I finally got down to playing it, it was one of the biggest gaming disappointments to me. I always try to be open-minded about these things. I love other Zelda remakes, so I swear this isn't just a case of nostalgia blindness. Obviously not everything here is bad either. The graphics look nice, and being able to skip forward in time more precisely is great for side quests where you don't want to just stand around for hours. But that's the thing, that's where the game is enhancing or adding quality of life improvements instead of removing or replacing great ideas. Those changes for the worse are on full display in these last two dungeons, and I think it holds back what could be a great experience. <sighs> This turned into a rant, I'm sorry. This video is already too long, and I apologize. This is a wrap on Majora's Mask. It's a wonderful game, and it's absolutely worth your time. It's one of my all-time favorites, and I hope that you'll love it too. More dungeon design videos are coming, and I hope you'll stick around for it. Next on the docket is The Wind Waker, and I'm really excited to hop into it. It's a great game too. All right guys, I'll catch you then. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe and stay tuned for when the next one comes out. Just want to take a quick moment to say thank you to the lovely people who supported me on Patreon. In particular, those who supported at the cheese tier or higher, which includes Tetra, Brenda, Callie, Justin, and Finley. Thank you so much, you guys, for the support, and I will catch you all next time. Bye-bye!